Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. We're five games into the season, and for once, the Flames are starting the season on a positive note, not stinking up the joint everywhere they go. I'm Dan, alongside Matt, who I think for the first time in a long time predicted this past week exactly. You said last week we were going to win in Nashville, lose in St. Louis, win in Colorado. I know, it's like, what's going on? The Flames are actually doing well, and I was correct. You know, it has. have we stepped into a parallel universe? Who are you, and what have you done with my co-host? Exactly. Um, you know, Matt, it's weird, because we're so used to, I think, and even coming into this season, I was kind of expecting the first month of shows to suck, because usually we're sitting here going, they'll get going next week, they'll get going next week. They'll get going next week. And it often takes us really till Christmas until we see some good hockey from this team. Yeah, exactly. And usually it's like, oh, well, player X will be, should be playing better. And, you know, usually that guy's the slow starter, whatever, whatever. You know, trying to cherry pick excuses for why they're being terrible, which sometimes, frankly, there is no excuse for them being so bad. But, you know. Then they bank on the seven-game December winning streak to get their season back in order and then kind of resets the whole thing and makes it a little bit more interesting to talk about then. Well, let's talk about the interesting week that we just finished. The Flames were on the road uh, for a three-game road swing. The first game that they played was last Tuesday, and Mike Smith was in net and made 43 saves. As I wouldn't have expected this, the Flames shut out the Predators, one of the best teams in the West right now. Um, this was Smith's first shutout of the season and the 37th of his career, and Monty potted two goals. Johnny had three assists for Calgary in this winning effort. Anything that you can take away from the team in this one? Anything you think they got to tighten up? Well, that, this is a, a perfect example of a game that stands out as being a flawed game for Corsi fans. Because of the fact that, like, the Flames were heavily outshot. Oh, yeah. But frankly, I could have stopped pretty much every single shot that Smith faced. Like, there was no traffic in front of him, and they were all from a sizable distance. Like, there was only the one uh, two-on-one chance where Smith had a had to make a really good save on that one. But other than that, like, he was not tested at all by any of the Nashville players. The Flames, to their credit, played very well defensively and kept uh, Nashville from having difficulty activating their defense. Even on the broadcast, they were mentioning how Roman Yossi wasn't able to jump into the play much because the Flames were shutting him down specifically. And it was just an easy night for the Flames, despite giving up 43 shots, they pretty much did everything correctly, and they capitalized on their chances and skated away with a relatively easy 3 nothing win. Yeah, I think you pointed out there what I was going to point out, and that's that they, even though there was a lot of shots on, they weren't quality shots. And I saw a lot in this game, the Flames sort of taking the Predators um, forwards off to the boards and keeping them out of that area between you know the neutral or between the uh, hash marks and sort of the middle of the faceoff circles, which is the most dangerous area. And credit to the Predators for still, I would say, getting a shot or two off every uh, offensive rush. I mean, they didn't lose the puck a whole lot. They were able to put it on net. But that's what you need against a, a good team like the Predators. Keep them out of the scoring lanes. And I thought we did that really well defensively. Mm-hmm. Calgary's defense played a perfect game, frankly in limiting anything that was actually dangerous other than that one two-on-one rush. Uh, but other than that, like it was probably the best single performance of team defense that I've seen the Flames play because they weren't allowing any chances, period, for the Predators, even though they did get 43 shots. Yeah, I think really if you look at a game that maybe the video guys want them to analyze, this is your game. I think this if the Flames could play that game, you know, in 70 games this year, they're going to win the majority of those. Yeah, it, exactly. And it if they played like that, then it would require a star caliber performance from the opposition to break through and actually score like a McDavid level 
or something like where they're just really a dynamite player doing something extraordinary versus yeah what we saw from Nashville for sure and I mean we got to give credit Nashville's a pretty good team this wasn't like the Flames did this to you know Arizona I mean to to get a shutout against a team I would say as high quality as Nashville's really a big feat yeah, they're the defending President's Trophy winner, and they, they even raised three banners before the game. You know, one for each goal the Flames scored. And <laughs> there you go. I, I wonder if it's like, all right, we got three. Stop there. That's enough. One for each banner. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, later in the week on Thursday, the Flames met the St. Louis Blues in St. Louis, and this game didn't go as well as the last one did. The Blues ended up uh, beating the Flames in this one by a 5-3 to three score. Um, I thought that there was some... I thought the Flames had some defensive lapses here. They didn't play as well as they did the night before. I guess on, on positive notes, James Neal, Derek Ryan, and Michael Backlund all got their first goals this season, and for Ryan and Neal, their first goals as Flames. But um, we went through two goalies. We played both Smith and Riddick here. Uh, I just thought, slop your effort by the team overall. Yeah, uh, frankly, the goals that Smith gave up, other than the one where he kind of turned it over and it went in, uh, other than that, like he didn't really have much of a chance with any of the other goals. And when you're giving a team like St. Louis the type of chances that they were getting, there's only so much that you can do. Yeah, and I also don't think that Calgary was getting as many chances as they needed either. Like they, they were almost the opposite of what we saw when Calgary played Nashville. I thought St. Louis did a good job of taking us out of the shooting lanes, putting us in bad spots to get good shots, and the Flames weren't able to fight through that. Yeah, and frankly, this has been a problem with the organization for a, a significant quantity of time where they'll have a really strong performance one night and then almost get complacent with, like, we have to actually do these things that were made us successful each night. And then, oh, well, we kicked the Nashville Predators' butt. We can just, you know, streamroll St. Louis. That's no big deal. And then, oh, it's 4-1. <laughs> you know, yeah, right no, off the bat. It's true. They get kind of streaky. One of the things that they need to do moving forward is get a little more consistency in their game from game to game. And I think with the with the lineup the way it is, the fact that we've really got, let's say, three full, you know, quality NHL lines, I think you'll see that. If somebody's not playing well or they're, you know, having an off night, we can easily sub guys in and out of that uh, the top minutes. Oh, for sure. And, like, we've even seen players getting sat for a game or two here and there. And that's and also that's not a good thing. And something we could afford to do in the past. Yeah, because it's like, hey, we have nine NHL forwards. We need them all to play. <laughs> yeah, and I think this year you'll definitely see that. If someone's not playing their best, hopefully they'll be, uh, you know, maybe resting a little bit more and letting other guys get in there. And that, I think, will help with the consistency. Mm -hmm. And then the last game of the road trip, the Calgary Flames went to Denver to take on, on Saturday night, the Colorado Avalanche. I was a little bit worried about this game at the beginning. The Avalanche got up 2 nothing early in the second period. Sam Bennett got his first of the year. Lindholm got his fourth. And then you could tell Johnny Goudreau had enough of the road trip. 46 seconds into the overtime, he ended it so that he could go home. Yeah, Riddick already knew before, uh, as soon as Gaudreau had the puck, yeah, I'm going home, yay. <laughs> there you go, it's like, you know what guys, we just want to get home, let's end this, put them out of their misery. I was a little concerned at the beginning, but I, like, I couldn't really fault the team for either the goals against at the in the first three minutes. That puck hopped on Brody, the second goal, that happens every once in a blue moon, it's just unfortunately he had pressure on him. And the guy made a very good shot. Uh, it just uh, bad luck more than anything. The first goal was just a lot of skill. Not much you can do. Like after that, like the Flames, the timeout by Bill Peters, which you know how many times last year were we complaining that you know the Flames would give up a couple of quick goals and then not take a timeout and then another two or three would go in. But, you know, it, once he, the team settled down and then Sam Bennett got that hit, it was basically all Calgary the rest of the way. Yeah, I'll disagree with you a little bit on Brody. I think that in in Brody's case, in both goals, I thought he blew his assignment a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but not to the extent where, like, it was solely his fault. 
No, but at the same time, as a top pairing guy, I wasn't expecting him to blow both those assignments. No. And that's and, that, was, that was a little worrisome to me. Yeah, but to his credit, he also bounced back in the game and was one of the better players from that point forward. Talking about some of the best players, I thought uh, Sam Bennett. This was the most complete game I can um, remember him seeing. He had a goal. He even had a couple big hits. Like, this guy was all over the ice and looking really good. And I thought, wow, where's that Bennett when we need him? Well, that's the thing. Like, last year and the year before, like you and I, we discussed Bennett and say that, like, he just seemed to be trying too hard all the time. And not just being patient and playing his game his way and be confident in his own game. And now, this season, he's not trying too much. And he's doing what he needs to do, which is the small, simple plays. He's generating a fair amount of offense and scored a goal, had a few big hits. Actually, one of his uh, hits later in the game on Zadorov uh, that, that broke that Zadorov's nice stick. Um, his, uh, that actually put a little bit of fear into him and it caused him to rush Zadorov later on, which... Uh, ended up Lin in Lindholm's goal because the guy made a bad pass and Nieto lost it and Lindholm was there for the right lane and ready to go and took the nice shot on Varlamov. But uh, it it's one of those things that he's starting to look like the player that he should have been. And like that's why when we've heard, like, oh, we should trade Sam Bennett or get rid of Sam Bennett, for whatever reason, it's never like I've always defended him saying that you have to be patient because sometimes it takes a while for players to figure it out. And in his case, it looks like he's slowly starting to figure it out. And if he can play like he did in Colorado on a regular basis, he'll join Kachuk, Monahan, and Gaudreau as being one of the four key players to this Flames team. Yeah, I think a lot of it, too, probably the makeup of his line this year is so much different. Um, you know, you look at who he's playing with and who he's played with in the past, and I think in the past he's really been looked at as being sort of the offensive piece on his line, and he's been playing a lot with Neil this year, and I think that now he can play, like you said, play a bit of a different game, be more himself, and have a more varied line there. I think that he's just, he's been allowed to not just be the guy who's got to, you know, make the pretty goal or receive all the passes and put them in the net he's he's being allowed to be I don't, I don't know if that makes sense but he's just being allowed to to play more freely yeah and he doesn't have to be the guy and i think elias lindholm when he was with carolina had much of the same problem because the hurricanes frankly have zero talent up front <laughs> and have had zero talent up front for a long time and so he kind of had to do everything yeah, well, it, and frankly, they are doing really well this year, at least to start, but, you know, it, 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 he's not a player, Lindholm's not a player where he can just go and create everything himself. He needs somebody to play with, and uh, now we're seeing that as, you know, he has four goals. I think his career high is 17, so I think he'll be breaking that this year unless he gets Break hurt. Break that by the end of November. Yeah, <laughs> I, to me, Lindholm's a lot like when Yari Hoodler was here, right? He was kind of looked at as being one of the guys in um, in Detroit, and then he came here and we put him on a line with Johnny and Monty, and he really became the top supporting cast member. And I look at Lindholm a lot the same way. I mean, they give an Oscar in the movies for best supporting cast member, and I think that that's really Lindholm's job right now. He's a top guy, but his he's a supporting player. Yeah, and that's important and necessary to have. It's just that now he has somebody who can actually put the puck on his stick in good positions where like, there was nobody that had any kind of passing ability like Gaudreau on the Hurricanes or even Monaghan. And now you go from that situation to two of the premier passers in the league and... You know, you just pretty much have to have your stick on the ice and ready to shoot at any point in time, and you're good to go. 
Yeah, no, I don't disagree. And I mean, even Furlan last year, we saw him put up a lot of offensive points with those guys. But I think that Lynn Holmes could be a bona fide top six right winger where, you know, Furlan and other guys have seen there, maybe not. Yeah. And Furlan did have 20 plus goals last year, but the knock on him was the rest of his game was kind of lacking. And Lindholm is a... And I don't think Lindholm has to be one of our top scorers, but I think he's got to be a big points guy. I think even if he's assisting on, you know, Johnny and Money, yeah. still doing his job. Yeah. Like, to me, like, the player that he reminds me the most of on the Flames is Michael Backlund. Just he has a better shot. And he's more of a defensive, responsible guy who has a good shot. And having him on that line helps both of them defensively as well. well that's it. It adds some, some defensive presence to that line instead of all offense uh-huh. um let's go back to a couple of things you mentioned earlier looking at and i use air quotes the timeout i've never heard so many people talk about a timeout before but i mean peters used this early in the first not even halfway through the first period just to calm his team down and i think especially now with the coaches challenge a lot more coaches want to hang on to their timeout in case they need it in case they need to do the challenge later and good for Peters for saying, you know what? Yeah, I could challenge, but this was the right time to use it. And I'm not saying that, you know, other times and other games he couldn't have calmed his troops down and done the same thing, but I think it was a it's just a very different coaching style we're seeing and that, you know, let's use the timeout. Let's He didn't even do a lot of coaching it didn't look like, but just kind of get the guys out of the game, take a break and send them back in. And I think it was a smart move. Yeah, I agree. And sometimes you just need to you mentally you get like in a spiral where things are just going wrong and going wrong and going wrong. And you just need something to like snap your head out of it, reset your mind and go back to it. And uh, with that time out, the flames pretty much right from that point forward started taking the game over and started implementing their game. And like after the first Sam Bennett hit the flames outshot the avalanche 30 to four, so, you know, just a small difference in well, shots you, there. And you come into a game with a certain plan, and maybe that plan now isn't going the way you want it after two goals. So sometimes the coach just has to, you know, pull the guys back and remind them that, guys, this is our plan, or, you know, hey, this is what we got to do here. And I, I would like to see, I mean, how many games have you been to where no timeout is even used? And it's, you know, like, I think it's something that needs to be used more in hockey. I know they only have one in other sports, like, you know, basketball, football, there's more timeouts. I wouldn't be opposed to one per period per team, but I just, it's one of those, I think, underutilized tools sometimes in hockey. Yeah, I agree. And I think the teams are more afraid now with the coaches challenge thing to actually use it. But frankly, it's sometimes it's just necessary, especially if you get two quick goals given up against you and your team's just kind of a little rattled. You just need them to calm down and that was very helpful and we'd see last year like with Gullitson where the Flames would give up two quick ones and they'd keep playing and then a third one would go in shortly after and then the game's over well it goes to what we talked about a lot last year which was the mental fortitude of the team right Mm -hmm. but yeah and and I think I mean I'm not on the board of governors I'm too tall to be the commissioner so what do I you know I can't make any decisions but if I was running the league, I'd almost say, why don't we give one, um, wh- why don't we give one timeout per period per team? And if you challenge, you only get one challenge a game, and you just lose your timeout for that period. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense to me. But you know, I understand why they don't want to do that, and that's more just for pace of game because you don't want teams like adding like an extra couple minutes every period just for but even then i mean nobody uses it as it is you know what's adding even if you had one more timeout so every team gets two nobody uses them as it is yeah i don't think that adding more is going to slow the game down that much we already have all these commercial breaks and stuff like that that slow the game Uh down so it was just it was interesting to see that used and used so early um the last thing i wanted to ask you about this game before we move on thoughts on david riddick this was his first start of the season and um, obviously a, a win there for him. What'd you think of our backup goaltender? It's weird with Riddick. And like, I remember, uh, watching a movie, uh, Cinderella man a number of years ago. And 
uh, Paul Giamatti was uh, talking to Renee Zellweger's character about her husband in the movie and saying that sometimes you see a glimpse of something there and you're not really sure if what you're seeing is actually there or if it's just a mirage type of thing. And with Riddick, I'm seeing a little bit of something there that makes me a little curious on what type of player he's going to be. And there's just a little bit more confidence and, and a little swagger to him, which is a little unusual for goaltenders. And usually if you have a goaltender that is as confident as Riddick appeared to be in that game, usually those guys tend to go on a really good streak where they become one of the better goaltenders, period. And I'm not sure if that's actually there or not, but I'd be curious to see him play a little more just to see if there's more there there. Yeah, I know where you're going with that. I think for me, and I, and I think as fans, we tend to want the backup to sort of be the next, you know, starter in the wings. And for me, I look at Riddick and say he's never going to be a starter. I'm never going to look at this guy as being the next heir apparent to the starter job for the Flames. I still think, and we'll talk about it more in the season, I still think that the Flames' answer this offseason is going to be a free agent acquisition. Um, and there's some good goalies that might be available. But I think... Bobrovsky. Bobrovsky. Um, you know, potentially Peter Morazic might be available. Um, Semyon Varlamov might be available. Um, I think, uh, what's his name out of Philadelphia? Um, Michael Newverth might be available. So there's some options out there. I think Bob is going to be overpriced because everyone's going to want him, but we'll talk about that as we get closer to that time. But I just think that, you know, we always want it to sort of be the, oh, this kid is going to be the next starter. And I don't see that with Riddick, but I think he's capable enough of playing back to backs and maybe 10 games and, you know, that is, I think, his upside. You look at a guy, I mean, there's lots of good backups over the years. And backups have worked with great um, starters who've never had to be that next starter. And, you know, I think that that's going to be his role, is he's going to be a good backup, a serviceable backup. The same reason why a guy like Curtis McElhaney still kicking around. Oh, yeah, I agree um, there. It's just that there's just little flashes of what he does on the ice that... It just stands out to me that there might be something more there there. And I'm not 100% sure. I'd have to see him play another handful of games. Yeah. There might be some more, but I don't think there's like 60 games no. more, let's put it that way, where he becomes a starter. No, but he could become a decently, like a better than average goalie. Yeah, I, I think he could be, he'd never be a 1A, 1B. I don't think he's that good, but he could kind of be the journeyman backup who everybody wants because he's a good, solid backup. And we see guys like that around the league as well. But I don't think he's your next Aaron Dell or Carter Hutton or a guy who, you know, might turn into a starter for the right team. Yeah, and I I just want to see a little more of him. And I I think that, like, having Smith play four of the five games, I think if you have him like say start three out of five then and give Riddick the other two that give more of an opportunity to see what's there with him yeah and I mean it's nice early because we're not like at the end of last season I think we were playing Smitty more than we needed to because we got desperate so I think you've got to give Riddick those chances early I mean last year we had Eddie Lack and no one was confident in Lack so they don't want to play him but I think if they're saying to Riddick, hey, we're confident in you, let's play him and let's see what we've got there, like you said. See if there's a glimmer of hope. And if not, we can always swap him for uh, Gillies or you know do something else if we need to. Exactly. It's just one of those things because I'm a little unconfident with Smith overall, just due to durability more than anything, that I'm wondering if Riddick would be better suited, like, giving him more of a shot sooner to kind of know what you have there. And if, like, say, Smith goes down or isn't very good, could he take over and for a little while as the starter if need be? See, I'm not confident with that. I'm not confident with Riddick playing, you know, starter minutes. I mean, you look at a week, a seven-day week. We've been playing three games last week, three games this week. I'm not confident in him starting two or three of those. I think he's good here and there, but... 
if we need someone to take starter minutes, I think we have to look outside the organization right now. Uh-huh. And we saw Riddick, I think that was his big downfall last season, was he was just playing too many minutes. And he looked good, but he just couldn't do that repetition that's required of a starter. Oh, well, we'll see. I'm just curious. You know, he, I like goalies, and so when I see somebody doing being a little c- more confident than normal in their own abilities, it makes me question if there's something more there. But... Who was that last goalie we had who did the karate? Oh, Henrik Carlson. Thought he was yeah. pretty confident. That's right. Yeah. Is it bad that we've gone through so many goalies? I'm starting to forget their names. Oh, I know. Uh, it's been a goalie carousel, but you know, a lot of teams have that until they find their good one. Yeah, and a lot of teams who had a good goalie like Kipper. I mean, they'd swap backups at every chance because it didn't really matter. Yeah, exactly. Hey, you're a warm body. You can play. Yay. <laughs> you have some pads. Yeah. Um, something I wanted to look at now that we're done talking about the games this week is, and I mentioned this to you before we started recording, I thought it was interesting who the Flames decided to scratch this week. We had Mark Jankowski, who was scratched for both the Nashville and the St. Louis games, and Froelich, who was scratched for the Colorado games. And I think we could both agree that both Janko and Froelich are probably part of the core. If we look at kind of a 9-forward, 10-forward core of this team, they're in that. So to me, it shows... I think the Flames coaching staff has a lot of confidence in this group to be able to sit those pieces out and in the case of the Colorado game and the Nashville game, still be successful. Yeah. I think that why Jankowski was sat was more that uh, I think that the coach is wanting more from him more than anything that he's done because he is a rather sizable player. And he doesn't utilize his physicality as much as he could. And I think that he might be getting sat to try and learn how to attack the game more and be more physically imposing than more gentlemanly like he has been. Yeah, it could be, and he comes from a... I think this is one of the big differences, too, is he comes from a college background, and there's not as much physical play generally at the U.S. college level, so it's just not something he's used to. No, and, like, even when he was younger, he was short, so, you know, he's, like, Johnny's size until his draft year, so... Yeah. You know, it, that also leads into it, because if you're that small, you're not exactly wanting to hit anything, because, you know, you're going to get creamed basically so yeah at the same time though i mean if you're playing in the canadian junior league sometimes it's you know hit or be hit and you learn how to how to hit to survive true so um especially i've always looked at the ohl as one of the bigger hitting leagues out there for juniors yeah well he did play in like the quebec high school league so yeah i don't think that counts no and then, interesting that as i talked to you about fro league scratching the colorado game i mean last year fro league was a one of our key forwards playing on the 3M line, and if he was scratched and healthy, the question would be like, hey, what the heck's going on here? So interesting interesting move there. Any idea why the coaching staff might have made that one? Well, the two bad penalties in the St. Louis game and the fact that he's been kind of mediocre to start the season. So, you know, try and light a fire under him to get him to play a little better. You know, it, it's one of those things where I'm thrilled that the coach is doing this because of the fact that, like, we saw how badly guys like Stajan and Brower struggled for, like, the entire year, and there was no accountability with either of them. Like, they'd Brower would be on the power play right through the end of the season. And it's like, um, he, he shouldn't even be in the lineup. Why is he on the power play? <laughs> Reminds me of Mason Raymond, too. Exactly. And, like, now at least this year, like, okay, yeah, for a leak, you're getting paid four and a half million dollars. Well, you play like it. <laughs> well, and we don't know what's going on there either. I mean, maybe, you know, for leak wasn't feeling well. Maybe he had something going on. But I think, again, the depth of this forward core, you can sit those guys, whether it's for motivation or for injury purposes. And sometimes we play guys we shouldn't be playing just because we are we don't have enough forwards we're confident in. So I'm hoping if you get someone like Monty, who you know maybe his wrist is acting up again, it, you say, okay, it's fine to sit for one game and you know rest it 
because we need you long term, and it almost becomes a better investment to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you're not desperate to have players in the lineup because, like last year, we only had like really eight NHL forwards and then four guys that really shouldn't have been in the NHL and aren't right now. (laughs) And yeah, so you know, it's one of those situations where now, like the Flames have probably 15 or 16 nhl caliber forwards between here and stockton so it gives them a little more flexibility with things well i said if you need to sit one night fine we'll find someone else to do the job whether that's you know on our roster or a call up but i think we'll, hopefully we'll see guys rotated in and out a little bit more as either they're not performing well they need to sit and work on something or they're just banged up and it becomes a maintenance day but I think a lot of people might forget, but what was it, two, three years ago when the Flames, big news that the Flames sat Goudreau for one game and then he came out on fire after that? So it could be a bit of a motivation tactic there as well. Yeah, and it's early in the season and you want to also give ice time to guys like Hathaway and Peluso just to see where they're at as well. And like Hathaway played rather well in the Colorado game and Peluso was decent enough in the other two games. Peluso, I think, did his job. Yeah, exactly. He was here for a specific thing, and he did that thing. Yep. Uh, you can't really complain with how either of them played, but you need to give those extra forwards ice time every once in a while. And it also sends a message to pretty much everybody in the lineup, either put up or you sit for a bit. True. And that accountability should motivate them all to be at their best, which is good for the Flames in the long run. Let's hope so. Well, one big concern I've had this week, um, and I've looked at the five games so far, the Flames are giving up a lot of goals. If we look in the season opener, they gave up five goals to Vancouver. They gave up four goals in the home opener. They gave up five goals against St. Louis and two goals against Colorado. But of the five, that's three games where they've given up four goals or more. There's a little worrisome so far especially for a team that was supposed to upgrade their defense don't you think in the three main games the two vancouver and the st louis game uh, the team was playing horrible defensively and like in the second vancouver game none of the four goals on smith you could isolate and say yeah that was all his fault and even in the st louis game other than the one where it was a turnover and the blues scored on that the other three he had no chance on. And the first Vancouver game, he didn't really have much of a chance because the Flames, as a team, were giving up way too much. And Well, that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying it's the goalie's problem, but defensively we need to tighten up there yeah. as a team and not, not let them get that many shots or that many quality shots on our goalie. Yeah, and it's a new system, and players are learning to adjust. Like The only guy that's really... Uh, well suited on the defense core that f- yeah exactly because hey i can i know you and your system rather well it's the only coach w- do i have to come to the meeting today or can i sleep <laughs> in i already know the answers to the test yep so you know he's all right and he's played to his credit he's played probably the best defensively of all the defensemen but yeah no i i'm hoping you're right i'm hoping it's just getting things going because I mean, I've always thought if you can score four goals in a game, it should be your game. And, I mean, Vancouver scored four in that season opener. You shouldn't have to score seven to beat them. And, you know, when St. Louis is scoring five, yeah, they probably deserve the win there. So I think we need to tighten that up. I know fans don't want those one nothing games we used to see from the Flames, but you can't be letting four goals in. And especially with a questionable goalie like Smitty, that's way too much rubber for him to see. Yeah, and... On a breakaway, frankly, it's more or less a 50-50 shot for either the goalie will stop it or he won't. And when you're giving up a handful of them every game, that's a little bit of a problem. And that's where a lot of the goals were happening was that like players were just wide open and good scoring chances. Yeah, guys, were, and it's, guys were blowing their coverage or letting players go past them. And that Nashville game needs to be the model. Yeah, and it it's one of those things where there is an adjustment period anytime you have a new coach. And frankly, the Flames have played rather well despite that. 
like the fact that they're three and two through the five games is actually remarkable considering the fact that everybody's kind of in that adjustment phase so if they can keep plodding along and getting better as time goes on then they should be fine moving forward it's just getting through the next couple weeks these guys played a lot of preseason hockey and i think you know they had a long flight to china where they could probably read the playbook if you will so i think that some of that early season uncertainty is gone but yeah i agree with you it'll probably take until i would say the end of october to really get comfortable with this coach and the fact they are doing so well, I think, speaks to the talent of this group, that they can sort of adapt quickly. And even if they're not doing what the coach wants, they're still finding ways to win games. Matt, did you hear anything about what was going on at practice today on Monday? There was some key guys not on the ice. Yeah, both Matt Monahan and Backlund were out uh, for maintenance. Backlund, I do believe, was out there briefly and then left. But Yeah, he was out there, he talked to one of the trainers, and then headed off the ice. Yeah, but it, it seemed to be like more just, hey, I'm a little sore, uh, just give me the day off, and uh, th- rather than like he's going to miss the next game. Monaghan... And Monaghan's is related to that block shot on Saturday. Yeah, and he did look kind of iffy after the block shot, so... I, if he does miss time, I think it'd only be the one game, not like a multi-game thing. And I think in that case, you'd see Lindholm become the center and a new winger for Gaudreau. Well, that's what I was going to ask. So just before we go there, I think the Flames are probably going to play it a little safe with Monahan, considering he came off three surgeries over the summer. I wouldn't be surprised if they sit him for that reason. And we just talked about the fact they're willing to sit some of their key play- key players. But it will put a dent in the lineup if one or both of those guys are out. So I agree with you. I think Goudreau and Lindholm become the center left on that line. Who would you have as their right winger? Well, I'd go so far as to reward Sam Bennett with his excellent play with a shot on the first line. Because why not? You know, you, you're you doing well. It, you, you know, if you're doing well, you should get rewarded. And so if there's an opportunity, why not give him a shot? It only Well, and do you remember a couple of years ago, you and I saw him and Goudreau in preseason and thought they looked awesome together. Yeah, and it's one of those things where in order to hopefully get him reset on his developmental path, if you can encourage him in that way, you know, and it actually works, then that would help him along and would help to salvage him as a player. Yeah. I, I think I'd go a little bit differently right now. I think I would either try Kachuk on that right wing, um, or if you don't want to put all your scoring on one line, I think I would go Goudreau, Lindholm, and Zarnik, and then Kachuk, Backlund, Bennett, line two. Yeah. I just don't know that Bennett... I mean, yeah, he's looked good with Goudreau, but I don't know if that's almost going to be overwhelming for him to go right from, say, line three to line one. I think you almost say, yeah, we're rewarding you. We're putting you out there with Kachuk and Backlund where you should still be able to play a great game. You're still going to be a key piece, but it's not quite to the top. Um, But either way, I can see – I could definitely see him being moved up. Yeah. I don't think Backlund's going to be out. If he is, then that becomes a little bit of a concern because we're kind of out of centers at that point. Today at practice, just for a body, Peluso was between Kachuk and Froelich, and if that's line two – uh, something is not right here. We got to make a call up quick. Uh, well, if say Backlund and Monahan are both out, then I think you go with say Gaudreau, uh, Lindholm, and say uh, Zarnik, as you mentioned, and then Kachuk, Bennett, and Neil for and make like a, the dirt bag line for line two. Uh, That's interesting. Yeah, see, I could see doing that. I could also see Zarnik, because Zarnik can play some center, and I think the team's more confident with him at center than Bennett. I could just see moving Zarnik to line two center. That's when I might move Bennett to line one, go Goudreau, Monaghan, Bennett, Kachuk, Zarnik, maybe Dubé, and then Bennett, Neal, and Jankowski. Oh. And I guess it's weird, because they brought Derek Ryan in to be a center, and he's been playing wings. You'd probably even bring him back up on one of those center spots. Yeah, and just you know, hit the button on the blender and see how it goes. <laughs> Which they've been doing already. Yep. 
Um, but, you know, it's, I mean, how often have we sat here in the past going, what winger do we think could maybe play center? Like, we're so deep, and it's it's a nice problem to have. Yeah. Which of our, like, nine centers can we play either at center or wing, it seems? And I, and I think this is going to become more and more important as the season drags on. I really think that's going to be one of the things that's going to help Calgary win games maybe they shouldn't be is the fact that they have so many guys that can play all over the ice. Definitely. Versatility always helps. I think it's honestly one of the things that's cost them in the past of just, you know, how often we had a guy where we go, well, he played center one time when he was seven, so let's put him at center today and see how he does. I think that, you know, we've we've run out of players for the right positions at some point. So I think that's been one of our Achilles heels, and it's definitely been solved. Well, look at last year. We had like three right wingers and two of them got hurt and we had nobody to replace them. Exactly. And then our season went to hell because of it. So at least yeah. this year we have that versatility where we have players that can play all three positions and it's just, okay, that's who I'm with. Okay, good. Let's go. Well, think this time last year, if we were talking about Monaghan and Backlund, both potentially being out. Oh, we would be dead in the water right then and there. You might as well. There, there is a, uh, rule in the nhl where you can actually wave a white flag and we might as well have almost done that yeah pretty much you know let's just go out there and forfeit this game a one nothing loss is acceptable in the rule books yeah um but yeah it's nice to see and another note from practice is travis hamanick uh has as we know got injured he's had his surgery i just want to read the uh note on it here um, according to Eric Francis, Hamannick has undergone surgery to insert plates into his face to presumably aid in the healing, and he won't be able to engage in physical activities for at least a week. Francis estimates it would be between three and five weeks before Hamannick would be able to return wearing a protective face shield. And then, of course, you know, probably we usually see a month or two until that comes off. So forgive the pun, but a bit of a bad break there for Hamannick. Um, he was on the ice. He skated on his own prior to practice this morning, still recovering from facial fracture that he suffered on opening night. Um, good to see these skating. Obviously, that's the biggest part of the recovery there. But it's it's really with him being out, it's given Rasmus Anderson, who, I, you know, I was a little disappointed that he didn't make the lineup right out of camp. It's given him a chance to show what he's got. And of the two defensemen, honestly, I think that Anderson has been the more NHL-ready-looking guy. What do you think? I think that Anderson's played well. I think that both him and Val Mackey have pretty much been equal in my book. Um, both of them have had very good parts of their game and then really bad parts of their game. So it they're rookies and they're both getting experience from it and they're both learning from it. So that's the important thing. Uh, I don't really I thought that the rookie rookie pairing really got exploited by some of the veteran forwards in St. Louis. I agree. And I think that, you know, the fact Anderson has been given some second pairing minutes ahead of stone also says a lot about what the coaching staff thinks of him. Yeah. And it allowed, you know, because Hannafin's really good defensively and, even just that for uh, that change for Hamilton has been a revelation, but uh, it allows uh, Anderson to be a little bit more risky in his play because Hannafin's there and he can try to test some things out to try and improve his game. So it helps having a very good two way defenseman like Hannafin to counterbalance the young pl players inexperience and assistant coach ryan huska said today on flames tv that he thinks for both use of valamaki and rasmus anderson the biggest thing that you get used to is still the speed of the game at the nhl level raz has played a little bit before played in the a but he says both guys are still that's the biggest thing they need to work on and i think we can see that for sure especially with big forwards coming down on them like i said i thought that st louis exploited those guys well and i think breaking them up at this point if we can is going to help a lot of that and show them like you said put them with someone a little more responsible who can clean up some of their mistakes until they get it all together yeah and the one good thing is is that both of them look like dynamite players in the making like, it's not like they're coming in and they're over their head the entire time and 
it's like uh how long until the injured guy's back like if the flames had to run with these six all year that'd be perfectly fine and that's a testament to how well they're playing they just still have to work on rounding out their game but that just is a matter of time at this point, when Hamannick comes back, based on what you've seen so far, what do you do? We're going to have one too many defensemen at that point. What would you do if you were the uh, coach? Raz goes just because. Really? Yeah, just because he's the right shooting defenseman. See, in that case, I would send Prout down because Stockton needs right-handed defenseman and Prout's a right-handed defenseman. Prout did well there last year, and I think I would make... Uh, I mean, we've seen, as we talked about, Janko and Froelich scratched. I think at that point, you're showing no veterans safe. I think Stone will probably have to become the seventh defenseman at that point. I Frankly, I think Stone's too good to be the number seven, so I'd be a little reticent to do that, but you could do that. I think even if even if Stone's your number seven, it gives you a lot of options. Sort of like we're seeing with Pelusa, where I didn't think he'd play. You could put Stone in and out based on what you're looking for that night. True. But I just think it's hard to take a guy like Raz and say, hey, you've done so well, but back down you go. It's almost like Janko last year. He came in on an injury, and he forced his way into the lineup. But I just don't know, at this point, how you can force your way in without... I think Stone's the odd man out. He either has to be traded or sat. Yeah, and it's still early, and we'll just have to see how things go, but it is possible that you could see Stone moved either to the the seventh defensive spot or via trade. But I just don't know if, if Stone's lost his spot to two rookies, is there much trade value left? True, and it, it's one of those things where we have to see, like, we're going to have three more weeks of these two guys playing, so we'll have more of a book then to see what you're actually dealing with instead of, because, like, they've only played five games, so it's a little hard still to figure out what exactly each of them is at this point. Because I think as we as we talked about earlier, though, it does mean that we're not going to have to rush Hamannick back. No, we can be patient because both those guys have played very well. So, and even when Hamannick comes back, could you see them not giving him second pairing minutes, but maybe give him those third pairing minutes just to get him back on the ice and slowly progress him up? That's feasible too. It just depends basically on how both Falamaki and Anderson play. If they continue to play as they have, then you can just be patient instead of rushing Hamnick back and possibly getting him re-injured. Yeah, and a jaw injuries always take a while too. Like yeah, you know they're gonna play with that silly sort of half visor, but. I don't know. It's it's going to take a while. I think slow is the best way to go. Bring them back in the lineup. Give them some third pair minutes. Let the kids do their thing. And I think if you could do even uh, Hannafin and, say, Anderson and Hamannick and Valimaki as your two pairs, that really helps to shelter those young kids. I agree. So we'll see what happens there. But, again, exciting to see some of the progression. Um, I did want to quickly point out, because I've heard some people talk about the 10 games uh, for for use of Valimaki. The 10 games where you can play a guy for 10 games, send him back, only applies for sending him back to junior. And while Valimaki is eligible, I believe he would be going back to the AHL. So they can keep him here as long as they want to. They don't have 10 games as a tryout, which we've seen in the past. So just to clear up some confusion I've heard there. Yeah. Uh, I don't... He still has, he's still uh, junior eligible, isn't he? Yeah, he's only 20. He just turned 20. So Yeah. Technically, he could go back, but he's uh, both a foreign player and an overager, so like no no team would want him to take two spots. So, and Stockton also needs some defensemen. Mm. But I don't see. I think there's no doubt he's ready to turn pro. Yeah, I don't see any point in him being in juniors or the AHL right at this point. He hasn't looked out of place. Nope. Well, well, we'll see what happens with those guys, but I think that'll be the story to follow over the next couple of weeks is what happens with the defenseman. And I'm I'm hoping, just because I think it's the easiest move, is at least send Prout down for a bit to figure things out. But at the same time, as I mentioned to you, I don't want Anderson sitting on the bench or in the press box. So 
maybe it's best to send Anderson down just to get him some play time. Yeah. I don't know. It's, That's the only reason why I immediately said Anderson should go back to Stockton, just because it, it's the easy way to do it, frankly. It, like it, it, yeah. It, we just have six NHL defensemen right now and a seventh one that's coming back it's just a numbers game and the guy that's hurts a right shooting defenseman he's a right shooting defenseman that's pretty much the only reason why yeah and I don't think it's the last we see of Anderson if that does happen no so yeah well that'll be a story we'll follow over the next couple of weeks but it's one that intrigues me just because i like all the defensemen we have and again good problem to have of having too many guys and trying to find whole spots for all of them and holes in the lineup mm-hmm. um we went out this week before we recorded and asked our fans on twitter our twitter account is twitter.com slash uh fireside podcast or at fireside podcast and on our Facebook account, or facebook.com slash fireside chat. And we asked you guys what you want us to cover this week. And if there's any burning questions or topics you want us to go over. And uh, Steve Doherty, who's at lots to say 21 on Twitter, asked us uh, about the, the Pedersen hit that we saw out of Vancouver. And could that have been Johnny? So, Matt, I think the best way to talk about this first is let's just talk about the hit and our thoughts. And why don't you start with your thoughts on that Pedersen hit? Well, uh, being a Florida Panthers fan, like I'm familiar with Matheson and how he plays, and he's not a dirty player. He's, quite frankly, a fan favorite in Florida. So the fact that he was the one that did this was a little bit of a surprise. And it if Pedersen wasn't, like six foot two, 160, uh, there's no injury on this play. If he was shorter, then I don't think that he would have there. He, Cause like, say he's Gaudreau. Uh, physically, Gaudreau's a stockier player, not even though he's not a heavy player. So him getting hit like that, he wouldn't get hurt in the manner that Pedersen did. But because Pedersen's so frail, there's just not enough body mass for him to shelter himself, even. And I think that... Like, if Pedersen was, say, 190 instead of 160, I think that there's no injury on the play. And I think the fact that Pedersen is... And I don't want to say the league's right or wrong to do this, too, but... The league likes rookie stories, and Pedersen's had a good start to the season. I think the fact that he's had such a good start for Vancouver, everyone's picking up on that story as well. Yeah, and frankly, he should win the Calder if he remains healthy, and because there's not really a ton of talent this year to compete with him. So he just needs to bulk up especially over the next couple of off seasons and be like 190 pounds just because he's going to get hit and he's not Gaudreau where you he's elusive and like if you're hitting him usually you're not catching him square it where Patterson's a tall player and he you're gonna get hit and you can't be 160 pounds when you're that size, like, it's just not feasible if you want to remain uninjured. <laughs> and it's unfortunate, but it's a confluence of both a unfortunate play that was a little over aggressive and dealing with a frail player. So, I mean, if that, and Steve's question here was. Could that have been Johnny? Of course it could have been. I mean, you know, players get hit all the time. Johnny is a top player, so he's the target for a lot of guys. But, you know, yeah, we don't know what the extent of the injury is. There's probably going to definitely be some brain injury, some head injury there. Would we be upset if it was Johnny? Sure we would. And we've seen, you know, the slashes and stuff on Johnny. We've all been um, disappointed by it. And I agree with your thoughts on on the hit and the players, but... I think that the Flames, I guess the question I would have for you is how would the how do you think the Flames would respond or should respond if that happened to Johnny? Oh, well, I think uh, what you saw with Dubé uh, would be the type of response that you'd see with Matheson. 
And it's unfortunate that it happened, but what likely would have happened if it was the Flames is that whichever tough-ish player was available would go and fight Matheson, and that would be basically the end of it. Uh, and frankly, if Gaudreau was hit in the exact same manner, I don't think Gaudreau gets hurt. Just because he's shorter? Yeah, and he's a little stockier. Like, Pedersen's very skinny. And, like, you, he, when he hit the ice, he kind of collapsed in on himself a bit. And, like, there's just not enough body there to insulate himself from the ice. And his head hit the ice. Where if it was Gaudreau, he's stocky enough where there's enough body there to prevent his head from smacking the ice. Yeah, for sure. I think it's it's kind of weird to say, well, could that have been Johnny or what would happen? Again, we don't know. Like you're saying, he has a different physical makeup. Nobody likes to see their star player or any player get hit like that. Um, it's unfortunate, you know, even though it's a Vancouver player, we still don't want to see that. It's unfortunate, but it's. I think it's tough to say what if. What about you, Matt? Is there anything else you'd you'd say on that? I mean, we could we could model out a trajectory of how we would fall, but that seems a little silly. Um, it would suck for sure if it was Johnny. Yeah, but like we've even seen hits like that before. Like Regeer used to do that to Hemsky all the time, and like Hemsky would never get hurt on that those plays and like it, it's frustrating to see a player like Patterson get hurt but it's a confluence of just a bad situation all the way around and it's unfortunate that he got hurt but it, frankly if he was any other player I don't think there's an injury there no and, and I mean we could debate and it would probably be debated a lot over the next couple of weeks so I don't necessarily want to get into it of if it was a good hit or not, I think that it probably wasn't a good hit. I don't know what you think. Um, Everything up to him throwing him down to the ice was A-OK. It was just the forcefully smashing him to the exactly. ice that was and that's kind of what I meant. The, over the yeah, line. The forceful smashing. And that crossed the line. And if it crossed the line, you should get disciplined. And he is. He's getting a two-game suspension. So, you know, I think that everything was handled the way it should have been there. You know, the player got suspended. It got dealt with by the league. It would suck if it was Johnny, but you know, I think also, like you said, Johnny wouldn't have the same impact. And I also no. feel like Johnny's a little bit more when he's on the ice, he's a little bit more aware of his surroundings than it seemed like Pedersen was as well. And Johnny's good at reading who's around him most of the time. Yeah. Very rarely does good girl get hit period, but just because he's small and elusive. So. Like when I watched the clip, it seemed like Pedersen was more focused on where the puck was than necessarily what players were around him and you know who could be coming for him. And it seems like Johnny has a little bit better, um, a little bit better spatial awareness, I guess, of who's where. Yeah, and that's part of learning at the NHL level as well. And we saw that in the first Vancouver game with Goodbranson nailing Dubé, who similarly wasn't aware of his surroundings and got clocked because of it. Yeah, it's like you said, it's part of the learnings, right? That's part of being an NHL player, and we gotta got to figure that out as players, and hopefully, I mean, I hate to say it, but hopefully it won't happen to him again, right? He'll keep his head up. I know when I was a kid, that was our coach's thing of just keep your head up and it won't happen again. Oh. Um, well, Matt, I think that pretty much wraps things up. I do want to pose a question to our listeners, and we used to do the weekly poll on our website, and we're going to do it a little bit differently this year. I'll post this question. We won't do one every week, but whenever we think we have a, a topic to talk about, I want to know your thoughts on Bill Peters as a coach so far. So let us know. We'll talk about the results next week. We will post this uh, poll on Twitter, where we are at Fireside Podcast. And we'll post on Facebook, where we're facebook.com slash fireside chat. So check it out there. Vote in the poll. Um, let us know what you think. And we would love to hear your thoughts. As well, if you want to, you can give us your thoughts by calling us. We have a voicemail and texting line. So you can phone us at 587-200-7176. We'll also put that into our show notes for the week. Again, that's 587-200-7176. And feel free to give us a call or send us a text. If you want to uh, text us, 
we'd be happy to to chat with you to hear uh, your thoughts. Probably not chat with you, but leave a voicemail and we'll play it on the show. And we want to know what you think of Bill Peters as as coach so far. So we'll talk about some of that feedback that we get from our listeners next week. Um, which brings us, Matt, to my one of my favorite parts of the show, and that's the predictions for the coming week. We talked about what happened last week. Flames again play three games between now and next Monday when we record. On the 17th, they're at home against Boston, the rematch of China. Um, on the 19th, Friday, they play Nashville at home. And then on the 21st, they go to the Big Apple to take on the New York Rangers. So three games on the table. What are your thoughts on how the Flames are going to do? I think they're going to get four points once again. And I think they're going to beat Nashville and New York. Yeah, why do you think those two? I Boston's a very good team. Like Even if they're having an off night, they're still very tough to beat. And I, they're a very complete team much like the Flames, and if Monaghan or Backlund are not 100%, I think that it's going to be tough to beat them. And Nashville, I think the Flames can... They're usually fun games with Nashville, but I think they can squeak out a win, and the Rangers are frankly terrible, so they should get two points. I think Nashville's going to come back with a bit of a vengeance after we beat them 3 nothing last week. So I'm I'm kind of thinking that they're not going to let the Flames play that kind of game again. The Flames lose. I agree with you about um, Boston being a complete team, but I also think the Flames have something to prove there after China. So I'm going to go with four points, but I think the Flames beat Boston and beat New York and lose to Nashville. Yeah. They better beat New York. Yeah, like New York has two points this year. They're tied with the Oilers yep. for the second worst team in the league, so you should be getting two points from them. Do you put Riddick? The in other that two game? teams are both for. Yeah, I I wouldn't even be opposed to Riddick playing more than one game this week, but I we'll I see. think if I was looking at this week, I'd play Smitty against Boston, Smitty against Nashville, and then if you Same want here. if you want Riddick to play two games, play him against New York and Montreal. Yeah. Well, I was thinking that like the Boston game, it depends on the Boston game. If the Flames lose badly, then Riddick gets Nashville and New York. Interesting. But it depends. Like it pretty much it just depends on Boston. Like if the Flames win against them, then might as well run Smith the next game as well. But it just depends. Like both Nashville and uh, Boston are four and one to start the year, so you know not exactly easy teams to face. So it those two games will be a very good test for the team, and hopefully they get two points out of it. Yeah, I guess my worry with uh, potentially putting Riddick Riddick in against Nashville is I think that they could easily light him up, and that's a great way for him to lose some of that swagger you were talking about earlier. Mm-hmm. I agree. You know, yeah, we'll he's see. doing well, but you got to manage, I think, where he's starting and what games he's playing in if you want to keep his confidence up. But we'll we'll see what the team ends up doing with him. So that brings us to the end of this week's show, and uh, five games in the books, three more next week. That'll be the third week of the NHL season. I can't believe it's the third week already, but Matt, I will talk to you next week, and go Flames, go! Thank you for listening, everyone. Have a good week. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.